Welcome to the webinar on renewable natural gas. I'm Dan Lashoff. Uh, we'll get started in just a few minutes if people are joining. Uh, I'm watching the uh, participant numbers click up, so we'll give that a couple minutes to uh, for everybody to be able to get in. Those of you who have just joined, welcome to the webinar on renewable natural gas. We'll get started in one minute. Uh, people are still uh, joining in and uh, I'll kick us off. So thanks for your patience. Good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you're joining from. Thanks for being with us for this uh, webinar on the role of renewable natural gas in state climate policy. My name is Dan Lashoff and I'm the director of WRI the United States. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with WRI, we are a global think and do tank committed to tackling the world's most pressing problems at the intersection of the environment, economics, development, and equity. Our approach starts with science and data. We call that count it. Uh, we then help identify design and analyze solutions, change it. And we work with partners in government and the private sector uh, and the nonprofit community to replicate proven approaches uh, to scale those solutions. In the United States, our primary focus is supporting the transition to a net zero emissions economy by no later than 2050. Uh, until last week, that meant focusing on supporting leadership by states, cities, and the private sector. We now have important new opportunities to also engage the federal government, but that does not diminish the importance of continuing leadership at the subnational level. And we'll be talking about that role uh, with respect to states and renewable natural gas today. Uh, and this builds on work that we've done uh, that you can find on our website on climate federalism, uh, an, an area that we'll continue to focus on. There is no silver bullet for deep decarbonization. Uh, the transition is going to require a multifaceted approach with different technologies addre addressing different emission sources and end use sectors. The WRUS program works on a broad portfolio of technology and policy solutions, including carbon removal, hydrogen, electricity markets, uh, industrial sector decarbonization, RNG, and others. Specifically, our research on renewable natural gas is, uh, has shown that it can be part of a broader toolkit of climate strategies, both as an option to capture methane emissions from organic waste and as a way to displace fossil fuel use, particularly in hard to abate sectors. However, as with any strategy, state policymakers, of course, face questions on what types of investments can lead to the most significant climate benefits and how RNG fits in alongside a mix of other strategies, uh, including electrification. While these are tough questions to tackle, WRI has uh, tried to inform the discussion with the, our recently released paper, Renewable Natural Gas as a Climate Strategy, Guidance for State Policymakers. Our aim is uh, to provide a resource uh, and with today's webinar as well, to bring together key stakeholders to share insights from experts and highlight the latest data and trends 
to enable informed decision making. Today's content will include a summary of research insights from our paper, uh, and then we'll move to a presentation from regional experts who can provide insights into how policy and project development are evolving and playing out in a variety of different contexts. So we hope to have you engaged in this discussion. Uh, we'll welcome questions uh, from the audience throughout today's webinar using the Q&A feature. Uh, we're also recording this. Uh, and so if you have colleagues who uh, want to tune in later, we'll make a link to the recording available in the day or so, uh, and we'll provide information on that in the chat. So uh, finally, just before turning it over to my colleague, Tom Sears, uh, to present the key findings from our research paper, I want to thank the UPS Foundation, which provided support for this work and previous work on RNG, and to our working group of stakeholders who contributed to uh, greatly to our efforts to pull this information together. Um, so with that, let me turn it over to Tom Sears, a research associate at WRI and lead author of our paper. Great, uh, thanks so much, Dan. And uh, as Dan mentioned, uh, over the following slides here, we'll be providing a quick overview of RNG and its potential as a climate strategy, summarizing some key takeaways from our most recent uh, paper uh, and walking through high level concepts before we hand things over to our guest speakers who we're very excited to have and they'll provide some more detailed regional context on the topic. So next slide, please. So before diving in though, just wanted to give some, some quick background on WRI's work on RNG. So for the last several years, uh, WRI has been doing independent research on RNG as a climate strategy. And we do this in three primary ways. The, the first is through convenings and dialogues. So bringing together stakeholders across academia, government and industry to inform our work. Um, and that includes uh, our, some of our guest speakers who we, we have on the webinar today. Um, we also do this through research. So releasing research papers, blogs and other materials to distill uh, insights. And that in includes our most recent research paper on RNG, which we certainly welcome everybody to check out. Um, and then also this includes outreach. So engaging with both technical audiences and, and the general public on these topics. Next slide, please. So I uh, always think it's helpful to start out with a quick definition here. So when, when we're talking about uh, renewable natural gas or RNG, we're typically talking about biogas derived from organic wastes that has been upgraded and processed um, to be interchangeable with uh, fossil natural gas or conventional natural gas. RNG can be produced from a, a wide array of organic waste streams, but common sources include landfills, food waste, animal manure, and wastewater plants. And since RNG can be produced from many different sources, it also has a wide array of environmental uh, impacts. Um, however, common benefits that can result from RNG projects include more sustainable waste management, reductions in methane emissions uh, from organic wastes and the displacement of fossil fuels in downstream applications. Also, uh, it's important to note that uh, most RNG projects rely on pretty well established technology. So anaerobic digester projects that convert organic waste to biogas to generate on-site heat or electricity have been around for decades in the US. Um, what is a more recent development though, and what separates an RNG project from traditional biogas projects is the upgrading of the fuel so that the methane content essentially makes it uh, essentially interchangeable with natural gas. And the number of projects now uh, uh, conducting this upgrading from biogas to RNG has grown dramatically in recent years, thanks in large part to uh, federal and state uh, fuel mandates. So next slide, please. So what, what are the climate impacts of RNG? Uh, as, as many uh, attending this webinar are, I'm sure, aware, climate benefits can range significantly from uh, feedstock to feedstock and project to project. Uh, and this is illustrated in the figure on the left here, showing the average carbon intensity of currently approved uh, California low carbon fuel standard projects, um, which can range from, for example, uh, landfill projects uh, which on average yield uh, some emissions benefits relative to conventional natural gas and definitely relative to diesel fuel, um, all the way down to animal manure projects, which on average are actually 
can be significantly net negative in terms of their emissions per unit of energy. So these values rely on a life cycle accounting approach, which is commonly used in state level assessments of RNG um, and is also the basis for state level regulatory programs such as the California uh, Low Carbon Fuel Standard and Oregon's Clean Fuel Program. Uh, just to, to walk through how these benefits are calculated in a bit more detail, if we take a, a hypothetical uh, food waste RNG project as shown on the right here, calculating life cycle emissions essentially involves having a balance sheet where you have emission sources on one side, including energy consumed for feedstock conversion, combustion emissions, any potential methane leakage, um, as well as credits on the other side, uh, including, for example, avoided flaring and methane emissions if the waste was otherwise landfilled. Uh, and this is essentially done so that impacts can be compared to a reference case in which RNG is not produced and the feedstocks are managed according to existing practices. So while impacts vary significantly uh, from one project to the next, some, some general rules of thumb uh, that we've uh, published in previous research are that projects are, are most likely to yield benefits when they are a derived from wastes rather than dedicated uses of land and b they re result in a net reduction in methane emissions uh, next slide please so uh, now moving on to the fundamental uh, issue of what uh, rng's potential role is in decarbonization um, some some basic questions here a first order question is how much can be produced and a, a second basic question is where can it be deployed? Um, and in terms of production, uh, studies find that wet waste sources uh, uh, in the US, which include food waste or animal manure, um, and which are converted to biogas through anaerobic digestion technology, could eventually yield as much as 780 to 1400 billion cubic feet of biomethane, which would be equivalent to roughly four to 7% of present day natural gas consumption in the US across the residential, commercial, and industrial sectors. Um, if we include dry waste resources, which are, for example, crop residues or forestry residues, research finds that total potential could be as high as 2000 BCF of biomethane, which would be equivalent to roughly 11% of current uh, natural gas consumption. Although conversion of these types of dry wastes relies on more nascent uh, gasification technology. So, uh, at a high level, what these estimates indicate is that much more RNG can be produced relative to what is produced uh, at today's levels. But at the same time, even at the, the high end of uh, resource supply potential, at least when we're talking about organic wastes, it's still uh, unlikely to be able to fully displace fossil fuel use in any one sector, such as buildings or transportation. Uh, despite this, RNG can play a complementary role alongside other decarbonization strategies, uh, and a growing number of modeling studies point to the value of an integrated approach to reducing energy emissions, including rapid electrification of vehicles and appliances, as well as the use of some combustion-based fuels such as RNG and hydrogen for end uses that are otherwise difficult to electrify, at least in the near term, such as heavy-duty vehicles or industrial heating. So how how all of this actually plays out over time is of course uh, uncertain, but a general takeaway is that while RNG is, is certainly not a substitute for electrification or adding wind and solar to the electric grid, it can be deployed to achieve additional emissions reductions alongside these strategies or serve as a bridge fuel as technology continues to develop. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and finally, before closing out, we just wanted to touch on the myriad of policy options that states have at their disposal to potentially advance RNG deployment. Um, there are a variety of different policy options, but three overarching buckets that we identify are climate and energy mandates, which can set uh, explicit requirements for the share of renewable fuels in the transportation sector, for example, uh, public financial support, so po policies that promote project development through grants and loans or other public financing, uh, and a sort of catch-all category of enabling policies, which can include regulatory actions that have important direct or indirect effects on uh, project deployment, such as uh, pipeline gas specification requirements. Uh, 
there's, there's really no one size fits all approach here since different states and regions have very different political and economic contexts. Uh, so what we highlight in our most recent research paper is how different types of policies link to different barriers on the ground and may connect to various state level priorities. Uh, for example, California's low carbon fuel standard has played a significant role in attracting investment and creating demand for RNG as a transportation fuel. The program also values RNG based on life cycle emissions impacts and so has the effect of incentivizing projects that contribute to the state's goals of reducing methane emissions from animal manure and other wastes. Uh, as another example, state grant and load programs for digester projects can help ensure that in-state uh, projects are prioritized uh, and that projects are prioritized which meet specific criteria, uh, perhaps regarding location or environmental co-benefits such as reduced air and water pollution from organic wastes. Uh, and to give just one more example, uh, waste management policies uh, such as food waste recycling mandates can provide an important market signal to drive demand for additional project capacity and incentivize the diversion of waste to more productive uses such as anaerobic digestion and conversion to RNG. Um, so certainly a lot to unpack there, but hopefully that provides a good overview of some of these uh, policies that states have taken um, or are considering taking. And uh, we'll now hand it back over to Dan, who will introduce our, our guest speakers to delve into these topics a little bit more deeply. So thank you. Unmute. Thanks, Tom. Uh, so we have uh, three guest speakers. Um, I'll introduce each of them in turn, and they'll give uh, a few minutes of remarks uh, from their perspective, uh, working on really implementing RNG at the, at the state or regional level. Uh, and then, um, and then we'll have a panel discussion uh, with uh, with each of them and Tom to join to, to answer questions that uh, some people have submitted beforehand. And uh, also, I see we're getting uh, some questions coming in in the Q and A. So we'll do our best to answer your questions. If we don't get to them during this session, um, we will uh, make them available to panelists uh, if they're able to follow up afterwards. So. Uh, hopefully, uh, please, you know, so please continue to ask questions and, and we'll get to as many as we can. But uh, without further delay, let me turn it to uh, Rebecca Smith. Rebecca has worked on policy related to climate change and renewable energy for over 14 years. She's currently senior policy analyst at the Oregon Department of Energy, where she focuses on alternative transportation fuels, especially in the medium and heavy duty sectors and issues related to natural gas, including RNG. Uh, prior to joining uh, the Oregon Department of Energy, Ms. Smith worked on greenhouse gas mitigation policies and corporate climate risk reduction at organizations, including Earth Advantage Institute, sorry, Earth Advantage Institute, Det Norska Veritas and Eco Security. So uh, Rebecca Smith, thank you. Thank you so much, Dan, and good morning and good afternoon to everybody. Uh, next slide, please. Today, I will be discussing some of the early progress Oregon has made with uh, RNG. First, I'll give you a lay of the land in Oregon with respect to our clean energy policies to better place our RNG efforts in context. I'll list the recent legislation related to RNG, and then I'll dive into the programs these bills have enabled, including our RNG inventory, our new utility RNG program, and our clean fuels program. Next slide. In Oregon, we have three natural gas utilities. Uh, by far the largest is Northwest Natural, uh, followed by Cascade and Avista. The map on the right shows Northwest Natural Service Territory, which is almost exclusively the western part of the state where we have our largest cities. Uh, Avista and Cascade Service Territories include smaller patches around the state. And Oregon is one of those states where many of the rural parts of the state are without natural gas utility service. Next slide. The new RNG policies I'll talk about fit into a larger landscape of clean energy legislation in Oregon. So for example, we've had an RPS since 2008 and our current target is 50% renewable by 2040 for our largest utilities. We also have greenhouse gas reduction goals and these were recently updated by executive order to 75% greenhouse gas emission reductions by 2050. Uh, our most populous county, Multnomah County, which includes Portland, 
recently adopted 100% renewable electricity goal by 2035 and 100% renewable energy by 2050. And then with respect to transportation, Oregon's clean fuel program launched in 2016. And Oregon is also a signatory to the multi-state medium and heavy duty zero emissions vehicle MOU, which is where states are working towards the goal of 100% all new medium and heavy duty vehicle sales as zero emissions by 2050. Next slide, please. So we've had two big pieces of RNG legislation in Oregon recently. The first in 2017 directed Odo to inventory the RNG resources into the state, in, in the state, sorry, and I'll go into that in a moment. The second bill, SB 98, directed our Public Utility Commission to adopt rules for natural gas utility RNG programs. Also, we're seeing more interest in hydrogen in Oregon, and often RNG and hydrogen are discussed together. So this session, we have a bill that's been introduced to provide property tax exemptions for facilities producing hydrogen using electrolysis or RNG. Next slide. So for our RNG inventory, we looked at six pathways. Four were wet waste pathways for anaerobic digestion, pardon me, and two were dry pathways for thermal gasification. We found uh, an annual potential of about 10 uh, BC, BCF for RNG from anaerobic digestion. And this represents about 4.5% of Oregon's annual natural gas consumption, uh, exclusive of electricity generation. We also found an annual potential of about 40 uh, BCF from RNG for thermal gasification. Um, and so that brings our kind of total theoretical potential in Oregon to 50 billion uh, cubic feet, uh, which represents about 22% of Oregon's annual natural gas consumption. The inventory also estimated various greenhouse gas emission reduction benefits um, from different uses of RNG. Next slide, please. So here you can see uh, the totals for uh, all the, produ the production pathways we looked at. Uh, you can see here that that potential from thermal gasification of dry feedstocks absolutely dwarfs that of anaerobic digestion of wet feedstocks. Um, however, as Tom mentioned, uh, this that gasification is really a nascent technology, not really seeing commercial scale deployment of it in the US yet. And so these numbers for um, these dry wet stock feedstocks are definitely very theoretical. Next slide, please. The uh, RNG inventory also looked at uh, different challenges and provided recommendations to support wider deployment of RNG, as well as next steps to build on this initial RNG. Two other recommendations, allowing natural gas companies to buy and sell RNG for their customers and allowing recovery of pipeline interconnection costs have now been addressed by legislation, SB 98. For next steps, Odo would like to develop a practical statewide RNG potential. And we'd also like to do uh, more targeted economic analyses related to the RNG production pathways and as well as uh, market economics and drivers. Next slide, please. Moving on. In 2019, the Oregon legislature passed uh, SB 98, which allows natural gas utilities in the state to buy and sell RNG to retail customers and to recover the costs via rates. This is uh, a voluntary program in that natural gas utilities may opt in if they wish to provide RNG to their customers, but they're not obliged to. And the costs and the benefits are shared across all ratepayers. The legislation specifically defines parameters for large utility programs and Northwest Naturals are only utility to meet that threshold. So for them, they may spend up to 5% of their annual revenue requirement to cover the incremental costs of RNG. And they may uh, add up to 5% RNG by volume uh, to its mix starting in 2020 with a terminal cap of 30% of their mix by 2050. Next slide, please. The PUC in Oregon opened its rulemaking in 2019 to implement this legislation. And that process tackled a number of questions, but I'm gonna focus on the first two, environmental attributes and interactions with existing programs. Next slide, please. So with respect to environmental attributes, PUC and stakeholders determined that defining these attributes of RNG according to the carbon intensity of a particular source of RNG was the most effective way to address concerns around both double counting, 
of those attributes, and then also interactions with previously established markets for RNG, namely the California and Oregon clean fuels programs. Both of these programs use a, a carbon intensity approach. So for each decatherm of RNG in Oregon, the environmental attributes are represented by a Renewable Thermal Certificate, or RTC. And these will be tracked through the MRETS electronic system, much the same way that RECs for our RPS are tracked by Regis. So the RTCs will be used to track the chain of custody of the attributes through a book and claim approach. So we're not physically tracking the RNG. And this is also similar to the accounting for the California Low Carbon Fuel Standard and the Oregon Clean Fuels Program. Next slide, please. Speaking of the Oregon Clean Fuels Program, uh, this program was launched in 2016, and its original goal was to reduce the average carbon intensity of Oregon's transportation fuels by 10% over 10 years. We recently had a gubernatorial executive order that's bumped that goal up to 20% um, below the baseline of 2015 by 2030 and 25% by 2035. Uh, in Oregon, almost all of our transportation fuels are imported, and the program regulates entities that import gasoline, diesel, ethanol, and biodiesel. Uh, credits for the program are generated by entities who provide fuel with a lower carbon intensity than the standard gasoline or diesel it replaces. Next slide, please. So in general for RNG, as you know, the transportation market has been um, a very lucrative, albeit volatile, revenue stream for RNG production. So this includes federal RINs, California Low Carbon Fuel Standard credits, and then Oregon Clean Fuels Program credits. So here on the left, uh, you can see the average annual prices for Oregon Clean Fuels credits starting in 2016 at a little over $50 and hitting as high as almost $150 in 2019. The volumes of RNG credited in the program are shown right, and these are broken out by CNG and LNG, and they're in diesel gallon equivalents. One important note on the clean fuels program is that generally all liquid fuels, except for LNG, must be reported by volume, whereas gaseous fuels like CNG are opt-in. So you see these dips on this graph, and those are, it's possible that these are just from low reporting quarters since they're not required to report. We're hoping as the program matures, we expect to see greater reporting. Next slide, please. I just wanted to put these uh, RNG numbers in the clean fuels program into context. Here are the overall volumes of credits in the Oregon clean fuels program by fuel type. And you can see it's dominated by ethanol, biodiesel and renewable diesel. So those green bars show the category of other and RNG wouldn't be included in there. Next slide, please. So in terms of what's next for Oregon with RNG, uh, we expect utilities um, identif to identify RNG projects and purchasing RNG for their customers as now allowed by uh, SB 98 legislation for utility RNG programs. And Northwest Natural has already moved forward on this. They recently announced a partnership to pr produce up to 1.2 billion BTUs per year of RNG. We're also expecting to see more RNG production facilities come online. And we have four facilities that are already well into the process of development, in addition to what we already have in the state. And then finally, as mentioned, Odo plans to continue its analysis of RNG in the state. And this includes development of that practical RNG potential and then economic analyses related to those RNG production pathways. So here on the right, uh, just for fun, is the pathway we mapped for thermal gasification in the 2018 inventory. Next slide, please. Uh, that's all I have, uh, but I am very happy to answer questions about RNG in New York. So New York, Oregon, <laughs> pardon. So please don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, that's a really, really helpful presentation. A uh, lot, lot going on. Uh, and uh, we're going to now turn to Sam Spofford. Uh, Sp Sam uh, has served as the Chief Executive Officer of Clean Fuels Ohio since the organization's founding in 2002. Under his leadership, Clean Fuels Ohio has become one of the leading clean cities coalitions making a major impact on advanced transportation deployment in Ohio. So for a Midwest perspective, uh, we'll turn it to Sam now. 
Thank you very much, Dan. Uh, and thanks also to Tom and World Resources for including me in this uh, webinar. Um, as uh, Dan mentioned, I'm Sam Spofforth and Killing Fields, Ohio is an organization that I've run for about 18, 19 years. Uh, we are a statewide nonprofit organization. Our entire focus is, is on the transportation sector uh, and we embrace and work to advance a wide range of uh, uh, clean and uh, sustainable uh, fuels and vehicle technologies. And that certainly includes renewable natural gas. It also includes um, electric vehicles, uh, various biofuels, propane auto gas, hydrogen, and um, um, efficiency technologies. We're, we're part of um, a national network that uh, many of you may have heard of called uh, uh, Clean Cities. It's organized through the U.S. Department of Energy. We're, about, we're one of about 80 to 85 uh, so-called coalitions in the country. Uh, for more information about uh, the, the, uh, the DOE's Clean Cities program, you can search for DOE Clean Cities and you'll see uh, where the coalitions are located across the country in various states. Um, we see RNG as an increasingly important uh, part of a focus on uh, transportation sustainability and really where the future lies in terms of natural gas vehicle deployments by fleets. Um, certainly as a heavy duty fuel is, is kind of where we see RNG fitting obviously. Um, we've had periodic engagement in RNG as an organization. It's been fairly intermittent because we don't have a lot of funding resources to support the work that we'd like to do on RNG as we do with uh, other, other fuels, especially EVs. Um, we did host a small conference about five years ago, a day-long conference that was focused on deployments of RNG in the transportation sector. I'm going to cover the Midwest, but uh, just as a caveat, um, you know, my expertise is really in Ohio. I'm going to do the best I can. I've reached out uh, to some colleagues, uh, but I'm sure I'm going to miss a lot of what's going on. So first of all, uh, on the policy front, um, we did not see too much yet in the Midwest at a state level in terms of um, uh, you know, statewide uh, climate plans. There are um, a few that we see emerging, uh, certainly nothing in Ohio at this point. Um, we, we do see some action uh, at the local level in cities. Um, unfortunately, uh, none of the programs that I'm aware of or, the, or uh, the, the policies and goals that I'm aware of in Ohio at the local level include a specific component for RNG. Um, we see some, um, uh, you know, other efforts in the Midwest. I think that what I would lift out most from a policy standpoint in the Midwest would be a regional collaboration that's being led by the Great Plains Institute that's focused on advancing uh, policy, uh, you know, uh, uh, being called clean fuels policy, but, but, uh, but essentially a low carbon fuel standard at the, st at the state level um, in many Midwestern states. And we're part of that effort to uh, ramp that up. Uh, so that's really the major effort. There's been some uh, other things, there's some legislation in Wisconsin uh, that was passed recently to create a clean energy and climate plan. It's got about a hundred recommendations. Uh, there is a there's a goal for 100% renewables. Uh, that's likely to include RNG in some way. Um, basically, in terms of policy barriers, uh, what I hear most is that we just don't see enough credits that are available. Look locally, you know, within the state nearby, uh, there's a lot of reliance in the Midwest on policies like the low carbon fuel standard in California and Oregon, uh, and then to a degree, the renewable fuel standard at the federal level. Um, interconnection in the Midwest remains a real barrier. Uh, hopefully we are going to see some progress there. Uh, the RNG coalition made me aware recently of an interconnection case at FERC that was uh, settled uh, uh, successfully that, that should help in terms of interconnection in the intercontinental pipelines, the interstate pipelines. There is a case pending in Missouri um, around interconnection that could have some real positive impact uh, in that state. And perhaps that's a model for, for uh, elsewhere. Um, one of the folks I spoke with told me that there's uh, really not a lot being done in terms of pursuing this um, 
um, electric vehicle pathway for RNG through the federal RFS, uh, in, but we will see what happens with the new administration. Um, <clears throat> generally, just a lot of hoops to jump through is, is what we hear the most, uh, both in terms of the, uh, uh, the, the, the federal RFS as well as the California low carbon fuel standard. Um, you know, I want to just turn a little bit to the to the fleet market and the transportation market, since that's kind of what we focus the most on. Um, generally, uh, you know, I think what's happening with RNG and I'm in the in, in I'm in the Midwest is we're seeing a lot of a lot of the market kind of get caught up in these larger dynamics that are really causing um, uh, a plateauing effect that we've seen for a number of years with. CNG uh, in general, uh, based upon very low and stable diesel prices. I think that's hurt adoption of RNG uh, 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 some in Ohio. Um, you know, we're seeing the industry make progress. I think as many people know, there's been some progress made certainly on heavy duty natural gas engines. You know, we think more is coming there. Um, just a few examples of some fleets people may have heard of in the Midwest. Um, Paper transport, a number of others in terms of uh, you know regional regional freight. Um, Ozinga is a deployer of renewable natural gas, uh, at least in Michigan. Perhaps other locations in the Midwest where they have operations. Uh, Fair Oaks Dairy has been uh, an, an historic user in Indiana of renewable natural gas in, um, in their fleets. In Ohio, uh, we have a major long-term user of CNG. Um, that is poised to, to begin using RNG. Uh, they're pre preparing a solicitation. Unfortunately, I'm not li at liberty to give the name, was not able to get uh, permission to mention them um, on this webinar, but uh, I, you know, uh, feel free to follow up with me on, on that. Um, on the production side in Ohio, um, you know, we've got a lot of kind of legacy uh, facilities, uh, salt waste um, uh, landfill in Franklin County, a very large producer of renewable natural gas, the Rumkey landfill down there in Cincinnati, very large producer dating back to the late 80s, early 90s of renewable natural gas. Uh, Quasar Energy Group is in the process of selling off their digesters, uh, not really because of any problems or concerns, just because it's their business model to kind of do that. Um, basically, uh, you know, and again, I, as I mentioned, there's really not too much happening on the policy front here in Ohio related to, related to RNG specifically. You know, we need to see more there. Bottom line, I would say, is that we, we see a, a lot of potential, and I'd say we see it across the network of uh, clean cities organizations that 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 uh, we work with a uh, huge potential for RNG really uh, RNG really where the industry is going in terms of any kind of natural gas vehicle utilization um, but we really need more education kind of one issue uh, in terms of Ohio on, on the fleet side is that we've had dialogue with fleets about RNG and about how they can seamlessly transition to using RNG uh, at no additional cost, um, no change in operations. And we hear that's just too good to, to be true. We don't believe it. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, so obviously we need more education there. Um, we also need more funding. We would love to do more work as a, as a nonprofit. You know, we have to depend on funding sources to support the work we're doing. We see a lot of potential. We have a tremendous amount of funding to work on electric vehicles and really none to work on RNG. And we feel that's something that needs to change. Just as a final reminder, uh, the DOE Clean Cities Network, uh, just you know, you can asset, access that by searching for DOE Clean Cities, find a local coalition near, near you uh, and happy to answer any, uh, answer any questions that I can. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. Uh, thanks very much. Now we'll turn to our final speaker before opening it up uh, to some questions. Uh, Chris Vole is an advocate for methane capture and use for more than 30 years. And uh, he has worked at the uh, Environmental Protection Agency uh, and in the Global Change Division, uh, two private RNG developers, the Solid Waste Association of North America, and represented the US government in Global Methane Initiative. He currently works for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Denmark and helps advance 
uh, solutions for biogas and RNG uh, in, from, uh, from, from Denmark uh, in the North American market. So uh, Chris, um, anxious to hear your comments. Thanks, Dan. <clears throat> uh, it's great to be here with you all. I wanna thank WRI and appreciate being able to uh, uh, have, worked, have worked with WRI over the last several years on the, on the RNG work, it's great. It's an exciting time to be in biogas and RNG. Um, you know, I've been in this field since 1986 and it's really time to scale uh, this industry. Um, I only have a short amount of time. I'm gonna to try to just bring some highlights uh, to you about how Denmark's journey in RNG has evolved. Uh, next slide, please. So just the lay of the land, uh, Denmark has some very aggressive climate goals. Uh, and the important part of this slide is that agriculture plays a huge part in uh, Denmark's economy. Uh, about two thirds of the land is under ag. Uh, they have, like we have in the US, experienced problems with water contamination and, and soil contamination in their past. And so that has driven much of uh, what we're going to talk about um, uh, in terms of properly treating agriculture waste, manure, food waste, and generating RNG as a result of that. As you can see, a large percentage of the Danish greenhouse gas estimates are from agriculture and about 55% of that is methane. Next slide. So there's been a journey uh, that has occurred really in the last uh, eight or so years. Um, uh, prior to that, there was approximately 100 digester projects in Denmark, uh, 50 on farm and about the same number at wastewater treatment plants. But post 2012, we've seen the growth of about 40 centralized co-digestion to RNG plants. And these are processing anywhere between 300,000 and a million tons a year. Uh, 300,000 is a large project right now uh, in the US market. Uh, so you can see that the scale in Denmark uh, is, is impressive. Another important point here is that the feedstock going into these 40 plants, about 13% is food and other organic waste streams, but those yield greater than 50% of the biogas. So co-digestion of manure and other organics is a pillar of the Danish biogas model. Right now, about 15% of the total dairy and hog manure is used for biogas production in Denmark. Next slide. So why has it been a priority? Uh, I'm not gonna get into a lot of detail. Obviously, uh, like many European countries, uh, where your energy comes from is important. So uh, uh, becoming more energy independent, but just as important as I just mentioned is properly managing uh, manure and protecting uh, air, land and water resources. Uh, how did they get there? There has been a rapid and professionalization of the industry, a lot of collaboration across sectors, and, and last but not least is farmer buy-in and uh, uh, the formation of cooperatives of farmers uh, to support these large projects. Next slide. So uh, certainly gonna just let you read this slide, but as uh, uh, was mentioned earlier for Oregon, there is definitely a patchwork of different drivers, some that are incentive driven, some that are regulatory. Um, draw to your attention that by 2023, uh, there's a real focus on food waste and removing it from uh, the, stream, the uh, stream to a higher and better use. Um, and so it really has taken this, uh, an evolution of different policies to get us where we are today. Next slide. So I wanna just quickly, uh, this slide comes from a company called Nature Energy, a very interesting company. Uh, 10 years ago, they were a supplier of fossil natural gas. They have evolved to be a 100% renewable natural gas company. But I show this really to show that anaerobic digestion really is seen as, as a part of an integrated system. Um, and, and Nature Energy currently owns 12 of these plants. Uh, a couple of things to, to draw out here. 
Um, if you see in the middle of the slide where it says combined with H with hydrogen gives green gas, definitely is a, a large uptick in interest in power to gas or power to X as it's referred to uh, in Denmark. Next slide, please. Here's a picture of a, of a typical plant. I think I've made most of these uh, uh, points um, already, but that is uh, a good example of one of those 40 plants that I talked about. Next slide. So where has all of that gotten Denmark to? Uh, uh, in 2020, uh, renewable natural gas constituted 15% of the, of the Danish gas consumption. Uh, because of that shift to these large centralized co-digestion facilities, there's been a fourfold increase in RNG production since 2012. Uh, this comes primarily from manure and food waste uh, and other agricultural products. And due to the plants that are already under construction, uh, it's expected that that will go to 25 to 30% by 2023. Next slide. Next slide. I just, this is an important point to make. Uh, this is an analysis from the Danish Energy Agency uh, where uh, the projection is that even after maximum theoretical elect electrification of um, many of the industries in Denmark, there will still be 25% remaining that cannot be served by more windmills or I'm sorry, oh boy, my, my colleague's gonna kill me wind turbines uh, or solar panels. Um, and, and so it just shows that we need additional renewable energy sources for some of our thermal needs. Next slide, please. And that will do it. I rushed through that, but I wanted to try to keep us on time. These are the companies that I represent, uh, things from uh, food waste pretreatment to enzyme treatment of uh, food waste and other organics. Uh, biogas cleaning and upgrading, um, uh, and, and, and many of the components and solutions for digestion and biogas uh, upgrade. So thank you, Dan. Appreciate it. Thank you, Chris. And that uh, does leave us about 15 minutes for uh, Q&A uh, here. We'll uh, open it up to the panel. I'll direct some questions to individuals, but uh, I'll give other people a chance to weigh in if they want. Um, and I think we can uh, maybe take the slide down so we can get a, a gallery view here if possible. Um, but let me start with uh, a, a basic question about uh, state level analysis. Uh, we got a question beforehand, is there a recipe for state level analysis of RNG potential and opportunities? Uh, Rebecca Smith, do you wanna start on that and then maybe Tom, if you want to chime in, uh, if that makes sense. Sure, thank you. So <clears throat> in Oregon, one of uh, the pillars of our process for the RNG inventory was convening an advisory group and that had stakeholders from all over the state. And one, it helped us um, to get buy-in from a lot of these stakers, stakeholders. And then two, it helped us to really refine um, our processes in terms of collecting that data and then analyzing it. Uh, another um, aspect I would say is, is that uh, collaboration with a lot of state and federal agencies on data. One area where data was definitely difficult to collect was on uh, food waste. So a lot of those, um, a lot of those entities, there's a lot of food production in Oregon and a, uh, they were not willing to share their data on food waste, so that was something that they would gladly sell to us, um, but they would not provide. But we really found um, invaluable amounts of data from other uh, state and federal agencies, and so that's what helped us to build what we think is a very robust uh, analysis of the technology. And I, uh, just jumping in on that as well, I, I, I don't think there's, there's a recipe per se, um, but there's, there's certainly frameworks and uh, there's a few states that have provided, I think, really good frameworks for how this can be done. And, and Oregon is one of them, right? So uh, a, a first step, and, and this is sort of what we lay out in this, this most recent uh, guidance paper that we released, uh, a first step is sort of to do an inventory of uh, waste-derived resources in, a, in your particular state or region. 
Um, uh, second step is to sort of identify uh, economic opportunities based on that assessment. So are, resources, are there resources that are co-located, right? Um, because especially with distributed resources um, like animal manure or potentially food waste projects, um, there's a need for centralized production in order to make the economics work, similar to what Chris was talking about earlier. Um, and then, a, you know, a third step is identifying, um, you know, based on those opportunities, identifying the priorities and how projects um, sort of link to different state level priorities and how to develop the right policies to make sure that those are linking up. So, um, you know, there's a, a lot that states can do, as, as we mentioned earlier. Um, but aligning, you know, RNG project development with goals like reducing emissions from uh, organic wastes, reducing those methane emissions, and also um, aligning RNG projects with, with co-benefits like reducing, um, for example, uh, animal manure pollution in watersheds or air quality uh, impacts from, from waste streams are also um, important things to consider. So. Um, yeah, again, I think there's, there's some good frameworks out there. Oregon has done great work, uh, Washington State, California, um, Iowa has developed a really good tool assessing resource potential. Um, so there's a lot, a lot happening and a lot, to, a lot of good examples to draw from. Great, thank you. Uh, let me switch gears a little bit and uh, talk about the use of RNG, mostly in, uh, mostly in heavy duty trucking right now. So um, Sam, the question for you is, do you see that continuing over the next five to 10 years? Uh, I think we'll, we'll see the introduction of some, uh, uh, the, 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 the famous Tesla semi and other uh, competition on the electrification side. Uh, can you talk about sort of how you see the demand for RNG evolving uh, and, and how it fits into a, a broader decarbonization of the transport sector? Yeah, well, thanks, Dan. I think it's going to, we're going to see, it's going to be a, a function of a combination of market evolution, um, how expensive diesel is, is, is a big driver for any of these alternatives, whether it's RNG or um, you know, um, anything else. So I think just the market where we, where we see diesel prices is going to be a major factor. I think policy will be another factor. Um, you know, candidly, my personal view is that we're still many years away from uh, really aggressive electrification of the heavy duty trucking sector, especially long haul. I think we'll see some real rapid gains in that sector on things like terminal tractors, uh, last mile, maybe regional freight, you know, we'll, you know, we'll begin to see that. I think, you know, Natural gas vehicles are, are I, I think, are going to have a role to play in the sector, especially big trucks and long haul for a long time. Um, and we see RNG, you know, perhaps policy driven, um, you know, really as the future of natural gas vehicles uh, in the heavy duty sector. Thanks. And uh, speaking of competition between uh, alternative fuels and diesel, uh, uh, Chris, I want to come to you with a question about sort of what, what you see as the future of technology. Are there technology breakthroughs for lowering the cost of RNG on the horizon or, or other uh, approaches that will uh, make it more competitive uh, in the market? Well, um, you know, people a lot smarter, smarter than I, Dan, have said that, that we're not really going to see the type of technology breakthrough that we might see for for instance, wind turbine and solar, where there was this incremental decrease in cost over time. That does not mean that there are not efficiency gains to be had. Um, you know, one of the things, in all honesty, uh, in Denmark that's going on right now is an analysis of the current uh, anaerobic digester fleet, uh, looking at the overall environmental benefits of it, um, but also taking into account uh, uh, things like leakage and other, you know, other aspects. So I do think that there can be some technology advances. Um, uh, I think they'll be incremental, though, and and not necessarily immediately transformative, if that makes sense. Okay, thanks. Well, that that brings us me to a broader question. We've had a couple different versions of this question about how RNG fits into the broader decarbonization uh, of the economy and specifically are there risks around 
uh, investments in RNG creating stranded assets in the, in the gas infrastructure. Uh, if we are moving away from fossil gas at the same time we're investing in RNG, you know, what, what, what are the risks there and how do we manage those uh, from a policy perspective? And I'll, I'll open that up to anybody who wants to chime in. I'll jump in. Um, so certainly this is a conversation that we're seeing out west uh, and in Oregon, and it's part of a larger conversation around, uh, you know, electricity gener uh, decarbonization in general. And we've had a number of decarbonization reports for the West that have found that decarbonizing uh, the electricity load to at least something, you know, retaining five, six, seven percent natural gas is exponentially more affordable than that last hundred percent. Um, Odo is neutral on that. However, there are those who suggest that there may be a future for a while in natural gas for decarbonization. Um, what role renewable natural gas would play in that is questionable given the low supplies, but overall electricity decarbonization is more affordable when it's part of an economy-wide decarbonization and natural gas can really provide a lot of, uh, renewable natural gas can provide a lot of that decarbonization of those difficult to abate sectors, as you mentioned. So that's where we're at right now in Oregon and our largest natural gas utility, Northwest Natural, has been uh, very aggressive in its decarbonization planning. And uh, it's looking closely at RNG and at hydrogen as a way to continue to decarbonize its mix um, and hopefully still you know, provide service. Dan, I guess if, if I could add in a quick comment, uh, uh, and, and I think, you know, uh, I think it was Rebecca actually that brought this up early in her comments is I think we do need to look at the co-benefits. Um, and I don't know if this is specifically to your question, but we have nine states currently that have food waste uh, diversion laws in place in the country. And, you know, meeting those goals, um, you know, is going to be difficult, but I see RNG as a, as a poll uh, to, to help meet those broader environmental goals as, as well as producing RNG. So I think that's one thing that has served as a bit of a hurdle and a barrier is that people look at biogas simply from an energy perspective. And I, I'll offer that it's much more than that. Um, and so you asked me in the earlier question about technology fixes. I don't know that technology fixes will necessarily get us where we need to go, but policy fixes where we try to look at this more in a holistic uh, viewpoint uh, could make a big difference. Um, and co-digestion, there's some definite uh, policy, in my humble opinion, some policy disconnects in, in our treatment of food waste and being co-digested and, and then lowering the value of a project. Uh, so all right, I'll be quiet now and uh, let let others speak. <laughs> so, uh, well, then, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Sam. Just to build on that, I mean, I think not only the food waste diversion point, uh, but you know, agricultural wastes and and this, you know, this this issue of uncontrolled methane emissions. I mean, I think that really is the framework to think about this, and but it's got to be driven by policy, you know, and hopefully that's what we will see. Yeah, just to, to build on that, the, another question that came in was around uh, the sources of RNG and the, does it require collecting waste from CAFOs? Is that a major source? And uh, do we expect the uh, sort of availability of those organic materials to change over time if people are reducing meat in their diet or other regulatory changes or, or, or uh, consumer preference changes that might reduce the the prevalence of CAFOs, or do we see that as a, a sort of steady uh, source of organic material? Uh, I, you know, I think over time, Dan, you know, indications are people may start to reduce that and already have, but uh, I certainly don't see the the meat or dairy industry uh, going away anytime soon. So. Uh, from my perspective, I think we're going to have manure for, for a long period to come. And I would just like to add that if you remember Oregon's RNG inventory, the biggest theoretical potential comes from thermal gasification of dry 
biomass. And especially in Oregon, we are a wildfire state. We are looking actively at how to handle um, woody biomass from, from wildfire prevention. Um, if we can bring down that thermal gasification and cost, that is uh, a source that dwarfs the anaerobic digestion and would be, I think, uh, a more sustainable source in that we would continue to see um, a lot of it. Great, thank you so much. I think we're gonna leave it there for the Q&A. Uh, appreciate uh, everybody joining us today and, and the panel for, for that conversation. I think uh, we heard a uh, clear message around thinking through the co-benefits, uh, whether it's on fire risk reduction or methane emissions to the atmosphere is a key component of designing a strategy around RNG. And uh, that, that makes a lot of sense, um, but uh, been a lot of interest uh, in this uh, webinar, so I appreciate everybody joining us. And again, um, the uh, the webinar itself, the slide decks uh, will be available on our website uh, at the events page. And uh, if you did have questions that we weren't able to get to, sorry about that, uh, we will uh, circulate those questions to the panelists and, and they may follow up with you um, to answer specific questions that we did not get to today. But uh, with that, uh, thanks again for joining us, and uh, that is the end of today's webinar.